I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Broadcom and Qualcomm brace for a battle as a $105 billion offer hangs in the balance. The biggest deal in the history of tech is already turning hostile. Plus, the telecom match made in heaven is no more. Sprint and T-Mobile jilted at the altar. We'll break down what went wrong and the uncertain future for America's fourth largest wireless carrier. And the massive document leak that purportedly shed lights on how Apple sidestepped billions in U.S. taxes. Apple cited multiple documents in the so-called Paradise Papers. We'll look at Apple's involvement in offshore finance. But first, to our lead, more details emerging what could be the largest tech deal ever, Broadcom's bid to buy Qualcomm. Broadcom has made a $105 billion offer could be $70 a share in cash and stock, a 28% premium over Qualcomm's closing price before Bloomberg broke news of this deal back on November 2nd. But now Broadcom saying it's prepared for a hostile takeover if Qualcomm's board doesn't play ball. Meanwhile, shares of Qualcomm up as much as one point today. Broadcom has moved 1.5%, another 1.5%. If the deal goes through, it would make Broadcom the world's third largest chipmunker behind only Intel and Samsung. Joining me right now to discuss this is Bloomberg's Ian King, who helped break the story last week. Also with me, Bloomberg Gadfly columnist, Brooke Sutherland. Brooke, let me start with you. Uh, this deal uh, at a time of, of, of M&A, this is as big as M&A has ever been in the history of tech. It is, which is a little crazy to think about. And you sort of have to wonder, you know, we've seen a ton of really big M&A deals just in these past couple of weeks, you know, not just in tech, but in some of these other sectors. And I don't know if something's in the water, but it certainly seems like they are active. Um, I think what's going to be interesting here, as you said, is that, you know, Broadcom is contemplating taking this hostel. We haven't really seen a really big hostel M&A situation that's really gone all the way. You know, there were some speculation that maybe Bayer would take its M&A battle with Monsanto Hostel. We never quite got to that point. So it will be interesting to see how this plays out. It's very 1980s of them, a fascinating <laughs> one. Uh, Ian King, uh, we just had the same conversation on Bloomberg Radio when you were on Bloomberg Market with Carol Masser and I. But uh, let me ask you, you know, what help us understand what's different about the chips that Qualcomm makes and the products that Broadcom makes. Yeah, I mean, the overlap is in the phone. Um, if you connect to a cellular network, then you're using a Qualcomm chip. If you connect to your, your home um, internet using Wi-Fi, you're probably using a Broadcom chip. So obviously, some similarities there, but not quite um, the exact same thing. And in broader terms, you know, they do do other things. Broadcom is very big in what's called switches, those little chips in, that send information around data centers between computers. So it sounds like really uh, Broadcom's emphasis on uh, the movement of information to mobile phones, Qualcomm's emphasis on the, uh, the re receipt of said information, and maybe a little bit of the processing of the, that information on the mobile phone. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good way to look at it. I mean, what's important here, though, is how that is going to factor into the considerations that regulators are going to put in on this. If you talk to Broadcom, not going to be a problem. I mean, I spoke with the CEO earlier today, and he was saying, look, we've thought this through. We've, you know, we're sure that our customers don't mind, and we think we can see this through the regulatory process, and we'll see. I want to get back to that idea. There's a, there's a tantalizing clue you just left us with, Ian King. But, Brooke, let me ask you, as it relates to sort of M&A activity and this White House, we saw the Broadcom CEO stand with President Trump and say, hey, I've moved the company to the U.S., which was sort of a head fake because they already had a, a co-headquarters in San Jose, California. But in terms of the regulatory environment, the Trump administration, you know, this would concentrate an enormous amount of power in one company, both distributing data and managing the data on phones and surely put them in a better position to raise prices. Sure. You know, to Ian's point, we'll see, you know, what antitrust regulators do with this. I think that you are going to have one company controlling a very significant amount of the market for smartphone technologies, and that is going to be something that's looked at. But this deal would have been impossible if you didn't have Broadcom trying to become a U.S. company. Just, I mean, it's still trying to buy Brocade Communications. That right. is a significantly smaller deal at like 5.9 But Brocade really important, too, because it controls chips that inv are involved in switching of storage. So you'll have one company, if all these deals go through, controlling the sh the, the, what happens in storage and the management of information when it comes off of a disk, whether it's solid state or, or, or spinning disk of some kind. Then you've got the management of networks with Broadcom chips and network devices. Then you would have Qualcomm chips 
chips into phones, you'd really have uh, from stem to stern, except for CPUs, you'd have a, a, you know, a Broadcom sitting in the center of all that. A very broad spectrum. And if Qualcomm goes ahead with it, it's NXP deal, then you would have chips that are used in the automotive industry. I mean, you this would just really be a behemoth. And I, you know, back to your point about Trump, I, it does make you sort of wonder what were the behind the scenes machinations going on here? And did he factor in this, you know, potential Qualcomm deal to his decision to relocate to the Surely U.S. Surely they knew it was underway before he was meeting the president, and then it just cooked these things up over the weekend or over a week or over a month. No, and it really was just a few days, which is just sort of, you know, whiplash. Exactly. So, Ian King, you did talk to the CEO of Broadcom, and, you know, the big issue, one of the reasons that Qualcomm's so cheap right now is it's not getting along with its biggest customer, Apple, and that Apple is threatening, we now understand, and it was important that you've done and others, that shows that Qualcomm uh, may be completely uh, uh, disintermediate out of the iPhone complete, uh, uh, that Apple might say, hey, we don't need you. We're developing our own Qualcomm-like devices. It sounds like the Broadcom CEO has already worked that out. And the thing that has devalued Qualcomm, Broadcom thinks they can get right beyond by getting a better relationship with Apple off the bat. Right, I mean, it's important to point out that, that Hawk wasn't saying anything explicit. Um, but when you ask him these questions, he basically asks it back to you and says, do you think I haven't thought about this? This is the kind of thing that he, you know, is kind of famous for in the semiconductor industry of, of dancing these dances. And it's just interesting what you said about the breadth of this company. You said, oh, they're, they're not in processors. Actually, Qualcomm is getting into processors right. this year, into PCs and into servers. So, you know, there's, that's a lot of things that are going to, a lot of questions that are going to be asked, a lot of potential customers that are going to be asked to weigh in, and a lot of things for the regulators to look at. For him to be this confident would indicate that he's already done a reasonable amount of work behind the scenes to kind of grease the wheels. Well, I don't think he lacks confidence otherwise, Ian, but let me ask you finally, maybe that actually helps the deal get done because Qualcomm could argue, hey, if we are bigger and stronger, we can actually finally offer a processor competitor to Intel, which Intel right. hasn't had since AMD fell on its face in the, in the PC world yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's certainly a part of it. Although, you know, our, our understanding at the moment, as we reported over the weekend, is Qualcomm do not like this deal. They think that this is a real lowball effort. They also think that the regulatory hurdles on it would be massive, or, or at least very time consuming and so our understanding is that they're not going to embrace this one and that you know Hawk is going to have to go directly to their shareholders and put and convince them that this is in their best interest if he wants to get this completed. Well, $70 a share is a lot to love. Ian King, thank you very much. Brooke Sutherland as well. Thanks for joining me here in the studio here in New York. All right, well, coming up, Sprint and T-Mobile call it quits and merger talks calling, sh causing shares to plunge. We're going to tell you what went wrong. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming right now on Twitter. Check us out at, at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 o'clock in New York, 2 o'clock back on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Now a story we're watching. Disney is said to have held talks to buy 21st Century Fox's movie studio and lots of other cable assets. This deal would have given the entertainment giant control of another studio and TV networks across the world. According to a person familiar with the talks, two companies are no longer discussing this deal, but Fox and Disney shares both rose on the news and both companies declined to comment. Well, Sprint shares have plunged today after last-minute attempts to merge with T-Mobile collapsed over the weekend. And the fourth largest U.S. wireless carrier, Sprint, hasn't had a profitable year in a decade, servicing $38 billion in debt. Now, the tie-up would have enabled Sprint to form a competitor big enough, perhaps, to challenge AT&T and Verizon. But after the deal's failure was announced, Sprint chairman Matsuyoshi Sun tried to calm the nerves of investors. Maintaining the management right on Sprint is quite significant for our strategic future of the SoftBank Group. The Sprint share dropped after merger talks with T-Mobile fell apart. But I said thank you. We can buy more Sprint shares at a cheaper price. We'd like to buy them to our limit. I don't think that was his real voice. It sounded like Bloomberg Radio's Michael Barr. Nonetheless... Joining us to understand this all right now, Los Angeles, from Los Angeles, Bloomberg's uh, Creighton Harrison joining us right now. And uh, this is a huge deal to me because it means so much for so many companies in technology. But just sticking with tele telephony, what does it mean for number three and number four not to come together? 
Well, it means uh, I think you got to throw in all four. Well, number yeah. one, two, three, and four in this. When I answer this question, it means more competition, more deals. Uh, uh, lower profit margins, <laughs> all of the above. I mean, we've seen throughout the world, whenever you have a market with four carriers go to three carriers, competition kind of slows down a little bit, the profits start building up, uh, things get a little more relaxed in the wireless industry if you're, if you're a company, if you're a consumer, it's the other way around, I guess. But, um, but when you have four competitors, things stay pretty competitive, and that's what we're gonna have now. Unfortunately for Sprint, which is number four, uh, and uh, and uh, has has kind of a history of, of, of losing money and and uh, of not being able to hang on to subscribers at the same rate as their competitors. Um, that means they've got to get their act together. Well, I think that that's just the point. I mean, what's happened with T-Mobile the last four or five years uh, under John Ledger is is really remarkable, at least to me. I mean, they've gone from being a pretty weak player to being a very strong one, not just gaining market share and fixing their own finances and, by the way, fixing their own business model, but they've had a real dramatic effect on what the big guys are doing at AT&T and Verizon. And they didn't do it from a position of market strength. They just came up with a better mousetrap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you talk about you know some of the things that that now are sort of universal in in, in the industry, like you know paying for your device separately if you want to, not as part of your contract. Uh, you know, unlimited uh, uh, plans. Uh, a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, T-Mobile was the originator, or at least sort of the popularizer popularizer of. Uh, in the industry, and that's again, that's what a four carrier market can do. Because remember, when T-Mobile started doing that stuff, it was number four. Um, so you're going to see Sprint try to innovate in the same way, while while T-Mobile continues to say they're going to push the envelope too. So it is, the reason I think this also matters is I always think one of the most important and least reported numbers in all of technology is the capital spending of Verizon, AT&T, and yes, T-Mobile and Sprint. T-Mobile and Sprint apart are going to spend a lot more money in the technology infrastructure out there, which has got to be good news for the tower companies, for the networking companies, for the companies selling the fiber, for every bulldozer out there that's hoping to dig a ditch. This is good news because they're going to be spending a lot more money. Oh, absolutely. I think those were among the happiest people today. If you had shares in a tower company, this was your day. Because you know that's that's what these companies live for is 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 network infrastructure in the wireless market, um, and they just got a big uh, present handed to them today. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. Since you're there in fancy Los Angeles, California, right now, uh, you are right down the block. You're on Avenue of the Stars, right there, a Bloomberg uh, bureau in Los Angeles, right down the blocks from the Fox Studios. Who could have imagined Disney? Uh, coming down from Burbank, making a play at those Fox studios and, and so many of those assets at Fox. Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's a bit of a surprise, and, and it's one of those deals where when it first comes out, you kind of scratch your head, and then you start to convince yourself that it might make a little sense. I mean, one thing that that Fox has going for it um, is this international business that that Disney really doesn't have. I mean, obviously Disney's everywhere around the world; they've got a huge business, but. They haven't. They don't have the levels of penetration that Fox does in uh, in some of the pay TV markets in uh, in Europe, uh, 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 specifically India is another place. And of course, another thing that Disney's talked about more and more is distribution, um, wanting to get closer to the consumer, uh, which is why they're doing some of these streaming services over the next few years. But Fox has a very sizable stake in Sky in Europe, which is one of the biggest pay TV providers. Maybe a sign that Disney's starting to contemplate a you know a more like I said a more direct relationship with the consumer through distribution. So to that you know it's interesting to me because it seems like that such an acquisition again we know that the talks are over now, but would be zigging when the rest of the industry is saying to zag. That is to say, there'd be uh, doubling down, acquiring cable assets. And, you know, cable assets like uh, National Geographic Channel and so on uh, that are part of the Fox uh, empire. At the same time that everyone else is saying, cut your losses on cable, cut your cords on cable, go for a skinny bum bundle, get out of the way. It sounds like Disney would be doubling down where they already are with ESPN. Yeah, I see what you're saying, and definitely nobody's in it like, oh, I need to have 50 channels instead of, you know, five really good ones right now. I get your point on that. But if you think about it in terms of content assets, in terms of brands, um, then it becomes kind of a different story. You know, Fox, uh, uh, the studio itself has things like the X-Men, which is a Marvel, you know, property, which Disney might be interested in. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that Disney might want to take a look at. Bloomer's Creighton Harrison, thank you very much for joining us. 
from Los Angeles. Coming up, a really interesting interview with the outgoing Cisco executive chairman, John Chambers. He spent billions of Cisco's money on startups over the years. Now he's applying those lessons to his own startups. He's going to share those lessons with us right next on Bloomberg. Well, Big Bad Cisco's always been about startups. Yes, well, under CEO John Chambers, the company acquired dozens and dozens of startups, spending billions of dollars and seeing sales grow from more than a billion dollars to over $40 billion over his 24 years at the helm. Well, earlier I talked to Chambers at the Economy Conference in Half Moon Bay, California, about startups and what the government can do to encourage startups. I think only halfway. Corey, I think we're viewing this as transactions, not part of a bigger picture. Uh, the U.S. has traditionally led in startups. Today, we are not at all. Uh, in the first uh, five years of this decade, we only grew our startup community by 12 percent over five years. Our peers, like Australia, France, India, grew by 40 to 60 percent. The Chinese grew by 100 percent. The Chinese do 4,000 startups per day. We are not entitled. We have to disrupt or get disrupted. It. You're now seeing countries such as France, which was the last place you and I would have done business uh, three or four years ago, become the startup nation of Europe. Uh, you watch President Hollande and now President Macron lead in changing their country. But they don't do it by transactions. They do it by combining the whole picture together. GDP growth, startups, that's where all job creation will occur. How does that tie into your tax plan? How does that tie into your education system? How does that tie into your security? The U.S. is the only country in the world that does not have a national digital policy, of which startups is the number one job creation engine everywhere in the world. So we're behind. And while tax policy change is important and creating the right environment for start, uh, startups is important, we are lagging the rest of the world in the area that we must lead. So I think these were a good first step, but they're a step that we should have done 5, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we need to think about where we want to paint a picture of optimism for our country, how startups will be the job creation engine with large companies, Corey, not creating any incremental jobs in this next decade. 40% of them will go away. There'll be huge productivity there. If we're going to get 25 to 30 million jobs, it's got to be through a startup community, and it can't be at the anemic rate we are now. We are in last place, and we don't have a cohesive plan to tie it all together. Uh, we have even, elements you said, in John, silos, even, even such as tax policy, et cetera. Well, yeah, but even as Silicon Valley seems to be the envy of the world, I mean, mm -hmm. everywhere I go, everyone I talk to says, you know, we're creating the Silicon Valley of the sand, the Silicon Valley of the ocean or the Silicon Valley of Boston or the Silicon Valley of Israel or you know it seems that Silicon Valley is still held up as a model what is missing there what needs to happen well, you said it very well. We talked about Silicon Valley as being the example for the rest of the world, and then you paralleled Boston 128, which used to be the example two decades ago. You, if you don't make it disrupt, if you don't, you know, you've got to disrupt as opposed to be disrupted. It's got to be across all 50 states, not just in Silicon Valley. I'd argue Silicon Valley is a little bit out of touch with the rest of America about how we create jobs in throughout the central part of the nation and the southeast part of the nation. And as I go around the world, let's use India as an example. Modi is looking at creating Silicon Valleys in all 29 of his states in India for 1.3 billion people. He's talking about GDP growth not at 3 or 4 or 5 percent and being excited. He's talking about 7 to 10 percent. Uh, J.P. Morgan just came out the other day saying they predicted India would grow at 10 percent per year. India is growing because of Modi's digital agenda, because of job creation, inclusiveness across the board. That's what you see in France. The last place you would have done business three years ago, and we said it would become the startup nation of Europe. They set a pace to do this across the entire country. We need to do it in every street, in every city in our country. And we do not have a plan to do that. And then we got to bring education with us so the young people can participate in this future. Is there something that could be done with tax, re with, with cash repatriation that would encourage startups? Because last time we had a big cash repatriation for companies, we saw that went into buybacks and dividends. Didn't necessarily go into hiring. It didn't go into R&D. It just went into the shareholders' pockets, which you know, it's their company. I, I'm not necessarily against that. But if the goal is to encourage startups and if the goal is to encourage business investment, what uh, what ne necessary uh, a policy do you think needs to be attached to any repatriation uh, um, taxation policy? 
Well, Corey, you've hit both the opportunity but also the challenge. We have to think of how we solve a problem, not with a single silo or questions. We have to tie them together. So we need a much more competitive tax system. Dropping the corporate tax rate for startups at 20 percent is a great start. We've got to then combine with when you repatriate money, is this going to create an opportunity for startups? The answer is absolutely yes, because there'll be a number of startups bought and create a market where startups see an exit pa uh, pattern as well. But the major thing we can't fall into the trap of doing, there is no golden single solution. You've got to say, how do you combine this in a policy that combines startup engines with tax policy, with education, uh, thinking about how do we literally have a national startup mentality, and how do we capture the imagination of the Democrats and Republicans, not to argue about tax policy, which, Corey, you and I have been talking about for 15 years, but talk about the future in terms of the opportunity, inspiring hope that, again, Americans' children will have a better life than their parents. Right now, throughout the central part of the nation, the southeast, they don't believe that. And changing our education system. France is changing their whole education system around startups and digitization, partnering with Cisco. They will do it first with pilots, then they'll do it across the whole country. Why isn't the U.S. talking about changing an education system that is broke and doing it at speed? Key takeaway here, it's about innovation with speed. We're moving too slow. We don't have a national policy. This should be something the Democrats and Republicans are all over. Tax policy and repatriation is just one element of the equation. You need to say, how do we change the future? All right, we've got more with Cisco's John Chambers coming up next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The House Ways and Means Committee today began work on the Republicans' tax overhaul plan. Committee Chair Kevin Brady called it a monumental challenge, but added the legislation will help spur job growth and boost the economy. From top to bottom, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is the most transformational tax reform bill since President Reagan reformed the code in 1986. Democrats say the bill prioritizes the well-connected while raising taxes for millions of American families. The next round of NAFTA talks will begin two days earlier than originally planned, now set for November 15th through the 21st. Negotiators are also reportedly extending the fifth round of talks to allow more time to consider proposals. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis is facing a growing chorus of questions from NATO allies and partners about what the next steps will be in the fight against Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Mattis is in Finland for a week of meetings on how to preserve peace and ensure Islamic State militants don't rise again. British Prime Minister Theresa May is calling for a new culture of respect in public life, following what she's calling troubling allegations of sexual harassment and abuse in British politics. The scandal has already triggered the resignation of the country's defense secretary, an investigation of May's deputy, and suspensions of several lawmakers. Saudi banks have started freezing accounts of some former top officials and members of the family arrested this weekend. The move is reportedly based on instructions by Saudi Arabia's central bank. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and we're joined by Bloomberg's Ramey and Asensio in New York. He has a look at the markets in Asia. Ramey, good evening to you. Good evening to you, Elisa. That's right. Looking ahead to Asia Pacific, we've got central bank action for Australia as well as New Zealand. Let's go ahead and take a look at the futures there, pointing up higher by about half a percent in Sydney. Now, the RBA is expected to keep its cash rate on hold at one and a half percent. It's been there ever since mid-2016. Now, the reason for this is because inflation is still stubbornly below that two to three percent target, coming in at 1.8 percent for the third quarter. With that said, unemployment is down to five and a half percent, and growth is expected to rise. Now, let's go and take a look also what's happening with uh, New Zealand futures, because those ha are higher right now uh, on the order of about half a percent, and the New Zealand dollar, the Kiwi, is also higher. The uh, government there is thinking about adding an employment target to the RBNZ price stability objective, as well as a committee decision-making model for monetary policy decisions. All right, that is all right now. I'm Ramey Nascenti in New York. More of Bloomberg Technology coming up next.
with Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang. Well, Microsoft is long but a dominant software company, but it's one great success in hardware, of course, is the Xbox. And even as I speak right now, there is a line outside the Microsoft store near here on Fifth Avenue. Why? It's the latest Xbox, the Xbox One X, hours away from its release amidst this release. Microsoft also making some big changes in the business, increasing investments in in-house video games, including starting or acquiring studios. Joining us right now, uh, Phil Spencer, Microsoft's head of gaming. This is a change for you guys, because you have been canceling games, shuttering studios. Why the change? Well, gaming's a huge business, $100 billion business uh, globally, growing double digit. Microsoft has some unique assets with Xbox Live and Azure, Minecraft, the products that we build, and working with Satya Nadella and Amy Hood, the CFO, this is a category we want to be in and we want to invest in. Minecraft, Minecraft is an acquisition. I have to ask about this acquisition. I do want to get to the hardware, but my daughters are obsessed with Microsoft's Minecraft, and they're obsessed with Microsoft Minecraft on the Xbox, but on their phones, yeah. wherever they are, they take the games everywhere. It seems to me like that's a vision of a modern success, where a game came out of nowhere, like a Tetris or something, it's got, it got to be successful because the gameplay was great, and a really, you know, not pretty, but wonderful, in modern Legos or something. Well, and you, you hit on a really important part, that now players are playing the games across every device. Right, that's and, the thing that's amazing about it. And we're connecting those players across all of those devices. So your, your family can play Minecraft, somebody can be on Nintendo Switch playing with somebody on an iPhone. They didn't buy a device from us, but they're using Xbox Live, they're using Minecraft, they're playing together in the same worlds. Obviously for us, the console's an important part there, which is why we invest in Xbox and Xbox One X, but connecting the gamers wherever they are is the vision of Microsoft around what we're doing in gaming. So, which brings us back to the launch of the device. So, That's right. why launch and why spend uh, presumably hundreds of millions, if not more, developing a new Xbox console? Because you want to reach gamers on every screen, and a television screen is an incredibly important place where people play. Xbox One X is the, the most important. No. One, like The customer is the most important. None of the devices are the most important. It's the customer experience. They move from device to device. We have with Xbox a unique capability on television. Xbox One X, 4K console, most powerful console out there. Xbox One S, a great value in gaming. Both of them play all the same games, so you're able to play those games on your television. But when somebody goes onto a phone and wants to stay connected to their friends, they go to the PC, want to stay connected with their friends, we can bring those services to the gamers. How important is market, market share versus versus Nintendo and versus uh, Sony's PlayStation? The two metrics I really look at in the growth of this business is engagement of players. How many monthly active players do you have across any device? And what does your software and service revenue look like for those players? Because obviously we're in business and we're trying to monetize. Well, then why don't you give the boxes away? We, you know, boxes aren't the bar big part of the business, right. right? The margin on the box is minimal. We subsidize the boxes to get them out there in a lot of cases. But if someone owns a phone and doesn't want to go buy a console, we still want to be, them to be able to play our games, bring the services like our video distribution through Mixer, Xbox Live, Minecraft, as we talked about, bring it whatever device they have. We think on the television, there's a unique capability to play. It's a great communal atmosphere, people sitting on a couch with controllers playing. We think that's an important part of the gaming ecosystem. But there's a billion gamers on the planet. They play on all kinds of devices. Um, it seems also the Xbox Live uh, and the the like have been really important to your success. Yeah. But I still know about kids who are, who've got their cell phones out and have got speaker phones out instead of using Live. Uh, what what does that say about the way the games are played and the way the games are designed? Well, just because they have their phone out doesn't mean they're not on Xbox Live. Xbox Live is on Android. It's on iOS. We right. see millions of customers on those devices that we never see on any other device. So you really want to meet the customer and the device with the right scenario, whether it's voice, whether it's text, whether it's watching gameplay or playing games. You want to meet them on every device and make sure you have the right services. And like you hit it, make sure you focus on the customer, the device they want to use for the purpose they want to use it. What is the range of development cost for a serious console game right now? Oh, it's Bye. from... A million dollars for your, you know, now what you a see. Million, Microsoft no, no, is no. not doing a million dollar game. No, you talk about though the ecosystem. Okay. You have people who are starting games now with an idea. And right. the nice thing about these games today is you can actually put an idea out there and grow with the community. We have the game preview program, which allows people to ship unfinished games, get feedback from the community and grow those games. One of our biggest hits is coming on December 12th is Player Unknown Battlegrounds, one of the biggest, hottest games on PC out there today. But it ships 
early and it still hasn't hit 1.0. It's in kind of a pre-beta phase. Right. They have 18 million players already playing this game and they haven't hit 1.0 yet. Oh, we're looking at Forza right now. Yeah, yeah, Forza's a good I'm game. not a big game gamer. I love me some Forza. <laughs> in the other end of the extreme, there are very expensive games with the highest production value rivaling what you see in television today and high quality television or movies. I mean, it is it is a true so art the, form. What's the top of the line development cost for the biggest games and consoles? I'm not asking, oh, you can you easily build, build a game for over $100 million, easily. Uh, but that's long been true. That's been, that dollar amount's been out there. Has, has there, have we no, seen there's no, a, there's no like asymptotic growth in the development cost of games. But I'll say, in a way, once your game starts growing and people are playing, and you have games like a Minecraft or like a GTA that have been now played for years, you want to continue to feed that ecosystem, give them more content. Players stay engaged with games for an awful long time, and if you can continue to give them content and they have a great experience, that's awesome as a business. Now, I don't want to downplay this this release of the, this hardware device, but uh, uh, it is Good. iterative yes. uh, compared to some other major devices that have taken so long. Just really quickly, do you think we're going to see more iterative releases in this industry going forward, or we're just at a special time right now, kind of in between consoles when the market's really big and, and ready for this kind of thing? Uh, the customer will tell us. Like, just being honest, like we're we're trying something this time with Xbox One X. It's compatible with everything you've ever purchased on Xbox right. One. It plays all the same games, but gives you a capability on a 4K television that no other console can give you. I'm curious to see how people react to it. If they react to it well, we'll continue to try to create state-of-the-art hardware for people to play on their television. Well, as you told me, you've got lines down the block already waiting for this device. So a lot of people obviously really want to see this thing, as do I. Great stuff. Phil, uh, thanks for coming in from Seattle. We appreciate it. It's Phil Spencer. Microsoft's head of gaming right here in New York with us for now. All right, well, coming up, uh, the second part of my interview with uh, John Chambers, our interview with John Chambers from Cisco. He's going to tell us about the startups that have caught his eye, where he's putting his money, and why. That's next. This is Bloomberg. All right, now back to our conversation with Cisco's John Chambers. Chambers is long focused on market transitions, being ready for what comes next. Well, in part two of our interview, we got to look at how market transitions help affect his view of the startup landscape. I have a lot of limitations, but I'm usually pretty good on the market transitions from the role the internet played in our future uh, to voice becoming free to global digitization. Uh, and you think about startups, the big picture is very simple. Uh, that's where all the job creation will come. I'm going to invest in 10 to 12 startups. Uh, it's going to be spread pretty evenly throughout the United States, and we can talk about that later and around the world. Uh, they will vary from a, a drone startup uh, to a defensive drone startup to transparency transparency in open government, uh, to social media and how that will change the customer experience, to security around phones, to company like Pindrop that you and I talked about in February of this year, moving from literally fraud detection to voice authentication, all the way to our next source of protein, which will be uh, from crickets and from insects. Well, you will consume the majority of your protein 15 to 20 years from now on uh, animals from areas like crickets. Well, I want to break these ideas down. It's so Let's start with that cricket idea. So uh, I want to know what the company is, but I, I think the problem is so interesting because, as you mentioned, you know, protein is so expensive, the most expensive part of every meal around the world. It's also the, the, the most uh, time-consuming thing to create. It takes three years to raise a cow, for example, before it can be uh, used in the food chain, but also uh, has a, a big impact on the environment. Talk to me about this cricket investment. Well, basically, when I ran into the individual, Mohammed Ashur from Aspire Company uh, at the Clinton Global Initiative, the last thing I was going to do was invest in the next generation of food supply. I thought that had nothing to do with technology, yet it has everything. Basically, crickets can be the most safe form of protein raised at 1 percent of the space. We're running out of space to have the amount of uh, meat proteins and agricultural proteins generated. It does one-seventh the environmental impact impact and at a dramatically lower cost. So you combine all this together that the best way you can serve the environment isn't how what car you drive or your home, it's the protein you put on your plate. Crickets will be a staple, in my opinion, and I'm pretty good with the market transitions, uh, 15, to 20 per, 15 to 20 years from now are the majority of the protein that you consume. So it's a leap of faith, but it really talks about getting the transition with the Internet of Things, robotic, robotic cricket farming, capturing the cloud data capability 
to grow these faster and safer than we've ever done before. I think it, it will be served in everything where from those high-end restaurants are. I mean, to change world hunger. Oh, yeah, no smaller goal than that. Uh, where are you talking about in terms of markets for this yeah. cricket business? Well, first, I think it can solve world hunger. Uh, but the second thing is you're going to see it go everywhere. The Atlanta Hawks are already putting in their sporting stadiums. Uh, one of the top restaurants in America, Saison's, is putting it into their restaurants. Uh, they are a Michelin three-star restaurant in uh, uh, San Francisco. Uh, you will see it uh, literally play a huge role in global hunger. So where else can you make a difference in every aspect of our lives, including the environment, uh, than in this new source of protein for the the future. It's fascinating. Now, uh, you mentioned a company we talked about. It is. Uh, it's fun. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's got to be fun to, to do this stuff. You mentioned Pin Drop, a company yeah. we talked about uh, back in February. Mm -hmm. The company is interesting. been through a little bit of a transition, sort of seeing where its technology works best. I would imagine it's part of your learning process, too, having been through this with so many of the companies Cisco has acquired mm -hmm. over all the years and the startups within Cisco to sort of see a market transition happen while a product transition is happening as well. Well, you named it. Uh, I couldn't talk about it the last time we were on your show with VJ, who's a brilliant young CEO there. And that's the common theme that you see across my startups, a great CEO, a market transition. But when he got started, it was about fraud detection, and it's the top fraud detection in terms of call centers in the world, had eight out of ten of the largest banks. They're now moving to voice authentication. And instead of you and I being treated almost like a criminal when we call into our bank or our credit card with your mother's maiden name, what was your date of birth, all these statistics, Statistics, they will do voice authentication, combine that with what device we're calling in on, our biometrics in terms of the rhythm we use on the device, et cetera, and change this from a negative experience to a very positive experience. So you're seeing a transition there. You're seeing the same transition in terms of government transparency with a company called OpenGov, uh, headed uh, by Zach Bookman. Uh, basically, they provide transparency in the budgeting process and allow the government leaders and the citizens to see what you're doing and how you're spending your money. Sounds basic, but no one does it. State of Ohio, probably the lead here. Uh, they've moved from number 46 in the nation in two years by using this product to number one in terms of financial right. transparency. So what I try to do is get these transitions right in each category. And, and just for a minute left here uh, in terms of startups, uh, the drone sure. startup you have is so interesting. Well, the drones will change productivity in areas such as insurance uh, or in areas such as mining, but also defensive drone, Corey, unfortunately, you're going to see, I hope I'm wrong, in the next 18 to 24 months, uh, a bad guy come to a coliseum or a government building and drop munitions on that location. You saw it already uh, with the Mexican uh, organized crime. You saw unauthorized drones flying over U.S. military sites, etc. Defensive drones will be as important as the offensive use. And so a startup called D-Drone, uh, again headed by a young CEO is just awesome, I think may be one of the most exciting things to your viewers in the future as well. That was our interview with outgoing Cisco chairman John Chambers. Well, coming up, Tim Cook going back on his word. We're going to bring you major revelations about Apple's use of offshore tax havens next. This is Bloomberg. Apple's forward-looking financial planning has never been in clearer focus than it is today. Item one, Apple sold $7 billion in bonds today, not waiting for tax reform that might change its ability to repatriate cash, which brings us to item two. Today we saw documents obtained by the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists showing another approach to taxes from Apple, the company shifting billions of dollars in offshore cash holdings to the small island of Jersey which is the largest of the Channel Islands between England and France. Apple currently has $236 billion in profits parked overseas and chose Jersey to avoid a 2013 crackdown in its controversial Irish tax incentive. Now, back in 2015, when pressed by 60 Minutes on whether Apple's trying to avoid paying taxes overseas, Apple CEO Tim Cook said, quote, there's no truth behind it. 
But joining me to discuss this right now, Apple's, uh, Apple's, Bloomberg's Alex Webb, who covers Apple for us and all things Apple. Uh, and this issue of taxes for Apple uh, is a big one because it's the biggest company in the world. But this pile of cash st uh, stuffed by Apple, uh, the, nothing has ever been seen like this by any company ever, Alex. No, in fact, Apple, uh, one of the graphics that was in the story published by the BBC and other, other publications in the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists show that Apple's got more offshore cash than even the UK or the US. It's a big, it's a big old pile. Uh, you're, you're English. Tell us about Jersey. How likely a financial center is this? Well, Jersey is actually well known as having a disproportionate number of, of you know, banks and, and, and law firms dealing with this sort of stuff. A lot of um, private equity funds and venture capital funds are domiciled in Jersey for these tax reasons where they have you know, incredibly low tax rates. Um, in fact, my, our editor over here, Alice Navarro, is from Jersey, so we don't possibly um, speculate on how much he pays in tax. Ah. But um, yeah, if you, if, you're, if you have, for example, a foreign use uh, card from a British bank, often that is rooted through Jersey. Uh, and yet it's, they've had the ability to protect themselves from some foreign taxes as a result and uh, a crackdown from the EU. Apple gave us a statement. I want to read that statement, Alex, in mind. But uh, Apple said, quote, Apple believes every company has a responsibility to pay its taxes and it's the largest taxpayer in the world. Apple pays every dollar it owes in every country around the world. We're proud of the economic contributions we make to the countries and communities where we do business. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Apple uh, clearly wants to be the smartest company in the world and only pay what it owes and, and pay as little as possible. I think this sort of clearly demonstrates this, no? Yeah, essentially, because what had been happening was that Apple had managed to um, root a lot of its foreign uh, profits through Ireland and um, actually then reduce its tax exposure through various complicated means there. Um, now, when Ireland cracked down on some of these rules, what was the case essentially, and this is what um, Senator Carl Levine accused Apple of doing, was that essentially its offshore companies weren't domiciled anywhere, is what he said, um, because they could, if they were managed from outside Ireland, then they didn't need to owe any tax in Ireland, but then if they're not domiciled in the U.S., and they don't have to pay any tax in the U.S. either. So Ireland said you have to domicile somewhere. Apple then, according to this report from the, from the ICIJ, um, did some fishing around, looked to see where it might be possible to pay its taxes, and one of the answers that came back was Jersey. And they found this company, Applebee's, which is the, at the center of all of these, um, these allegations and reporting, um, and placed a lot of its um, management of the company, in theory, that was putting its tax taxes through Ireland, the management of that was effectively in Jersey, and therefore, right. according to the report, enabled to avoid some of the tax. And their cash management business is headquartered not in high-tax uh, Northern California, but in nearby Nevada, which has a, a, you know infinitesimal taxes compared to California, which is certainly a concern there, too. We showed a picture of Tim Cook just right now uh, opening the doors excitedly. I hope we're, we're going to see a repatriation like a Brinks truck roll in. But it does seem that Apple's in a position right now where they would maybe they don't need uh, a tax repatriation as much as other companies because they've been able to go through all these machinations to set themselves up for the current tax environment, not a fantasy tax environment where repatriation would be low tax and easy. Well, Apple has also been a huge beneficiary of the fact that interest rates are incredibly low. Uh, they are still able to reward shareholders and keep the, uh, the stock plumped up in, in fallow periods. And um, they have done so by issuing you know, close to $100 billion in debt. So even though they have in excess of $250 billion in cash reserves, they still have, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, they still have um, vast, um, vast um, debt offerings in order to reward their stockholders. Yeah, $116 billion in debt. If I go to the Bloomberg EV function, I also see we've got about $269 billion in cash. So as much as they borrow money, they're minting money even faster. It's interesting, though, if you see the rates at which their debt um, burden has increased compared to the, the, the rate at which their cash position has increased. And there have been whisperings amongst particularly some of the debt analysts, people like Moody's, about slight concern about that pace and a fear that at some stage the lines will cross. Now, that's not going to happen in the immediate future, um, but if, it, if there is no tax reform, then that does become a bit of an issue for some of these analysts. It does seem that they're always going to want to keep that cash, that the near-death experience of Apple in the past is always in their minds, Alex. Yes, and but equally, you know, if you look at the uh, the trajectory of the stock over the past year, a lot of it has been due to the iPhone 10, which of course is now out in stores. But some of it is attributable to the cash position, perhaps clearly not as much. Um, but it's also a reason for people to want to bet on Apple 
for the phone. If for some reason the, the optimism about the super cycle of the, the new iPhone, if those, um, those promises don't manifest themselves, then there's always a backup that, well, Apple has all this cash they can return to show, share, shareholders and we're never likely to lose out. Yeah, 58% rise in the stock in the last 12 months. Uh, something pretty amazing. Uh, Bloomberg Technologies' Alex Webb, thank you very much. Oh, well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.